Okay, this evening we're talking about um, a trip I went on uh, in late April. I stopped. Was it a good trip? It was a great trip. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you, gentlemen, who's in the audience. <laughs> and uh, it was a trip planned to Malta, and then I saw there was going to be an Ice Age art exhibit um, in London, so I stopped there on the way and learned a whole lot about how long we've been artists and how brilliant those artists were 40,000 years ago. And um, Malta, it turns out to be, and I think people are somewhat ignorant about it, including myself, um, uh, it's really, it has the oldest uh, standing structures that are independently standing uh, that we know of in the world, the, the stone structures. They're older, it's older than the pyramids, it's older than Stonehenge and Newgrange and those really ancient ones. Um, extremely old. And um, so I was fascinated How old with. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, about 7,000 years old, which is a long time ago. And uh, so um, this was to sh just to cover sort of what we're doing and how we're tying it to the current age and how um, the art sort of imbues everything that we do. Our art is an expression of our common unconscious, I think, and that's when it resonates with people. So our famous artists um, are very much in tune with what we carry and who knows, our DNA, our memories, a sort of, I guess I would call it a race memory for better, um, for, a be for a better term. Uh, you know, Carl Jung spoke about it quite a bit. But um, so this page is really about um, you know, you see, you see Picasso's work and, and he acknowledged that this piece of, of art that's 23,000 years old um, inspired him to do a lot of his works. Um, so I noticed there were some of the Cubist ones and some different ones that he had, had, he had inspired from that. And um, these two ladies at the top, um, they, call them the, they call them the sleeping ladies but we're pretty well aware that those were dream chambers. They had them in Greece, they had them um, in what, what, well, part of Greece now, but was Crete and Santorini. Um, and they were very spiritual places. It's where you would meditate. And um, so these are just two different ones of the dreaming ladies, as we call them. And I'll get a little more into the hypogeum, which is probably one of the most amazing places I've ever visited. It happens to be a subterranean terranean, um, facility that they dug out of the rock, so it's a, it's a spectacular place. And we'll get a little more into that. And I was just showing how, you know, we remember Diego Rivera. I mean, he did glamorous ladies, you know, the, the look that you're supposed to have in Hollywood now, but he also did the rounder women. He did a lot of that art. It was, and the, whole idea, I think, was the abundance of the earth, the fullness of life in the earth. And so so the ladies were round, representing our mother earth, our mother goddess. And um, so that's re really what this first page is. And since we have Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, the uh, entire, I think, uh, Gelman collection here at the uh, at the Nelson, and I was lucky enough, around the corner here, and I was lucky enough to go already, and I'm going again Friday, so, and I'll be taking, going with other people, but I, I like putting uh, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo up here, just because they're lovely examples of some of the things we're talking about, too. Um, this thread carries through probably all of humanity, as far as we know. There was always a creative urge. I guess the way I would approach it is what, um, Fritjof Capra, the quantum physicist, talked about. And um, it was when they started realizing that we aren't all these bunches of parts, that life is living systems. They all interact, and you can't take one piece out and take something apart and figure out how it works. It's all connected. So he, and the way he described uh, life in the film Mindwalk was that it is self-organizing, you know, sort of how our bodies function. It is self-renewing, you know, from the sense of our cells renewing, and we have all different cells in about seven years. 
uh, to having babies and uh, then they said, uh, and the last one is life is self-transcending, which is also that. I think to me that's communications, that's our creative urge, um, it's what makes us want to be more and see more and do more. So to me, they were certainly then as brilliantly aware of what life is that we're just starting to get the picture about here. It took us, you know, I mean, we're wonderful at science. And so I think we're at that stage now where we have to really look at things holistically as I think people generally use. But that's, uh, that's really the premise of where I'm going here, aside from the fact that these were exciting places. And I feel it. And oh, the other thing I find to be so wonderful is that I can feel kinship with some 40,000 year old relative of mine, you know, because I, I, when I went to the Ice Age art exhibit, I was dumbfounded with how I was just transfixed by how beautiful these pieces were. You could see what the person had poured into it, and it was, it was remarkable. I felt love from 40,000 years ago, which was pretty exciting. And, and the desire for life and a reverence for life that I find really profound. So um, this was something I was looking at. Um, this particular illustration at the bottom is from um, my current, I would call her a teacher, mentor. Um, I am very lucky to be studying with um, Wendy Ashley. And she was a student of Joseph Campbell's and Charles Ponce. She is the greatest fountain of mythological and full sky astrology knowledge of any person I've ever run into. She's, she knows myths from everywhere. So that's why I have her books at the back for people to look at in the break. Um, and what she had portrayed here was what people were seeing in the winter months when they would look at the night sky. Um, you would obviously build the fires and keep warm and further back in the cave. You know, it's the ice age. And um, this is the way you'd be, and they always built them facing south because it protected them from the north winds. And, um, well, they didn't build the caves. They selected the caves that were facing south. And this would have been their view of the sky and during the winter months in the northern hemisphere, probably the most, well, it's definitely the most prom prominent thing you see in the middle of the sky. There's a beautiful constellation, Taurus, the stunning Pleiades. Um, they're up in, in the bull's shoulder. And the, now Wendy thinks that these were four stars originally in Orion's belt instead of three. I think that's a possibility, or I think that might be the three stars and then a certain lunar thing, but that would be below the ecliptic, so I'm not sure. I guess maybe there were, you know, the, the sky has changed. There are stars that are not visible anymore that were, and there are stars that are visible now that weren't visible then. So, But it stayed, when you want to look at something that would put you in touch with our ancient ancestors and, and to get a sense of them, one thing that's pretty much the same as the sky. Um, so it's pretty spectacular to see that. Uh, Lascaux Cave, which is roughly 17,300 years old, um, had already was seeing a bull. And if you look at Taurus in the sky, the horns are very long. They show the tips of the horns, and it's these long, long horns that we don't see on cattle now. Well, they had the aurochs. Um, they were the bulls, that, the wild bulls that they would hunt in Europe, and they had very long horns like that. So I think our constellation Taurus is at least that old, which I find profound and moving. And I would love it if other people did, and hopefully some other people will be studying the ancient art, because it is the ancient art and the ancient astrology, because they go hand in hand. And um, here is the Cave of the Bulls from Lascaux, which is just a stunning sight. You don't really get into the actual Lascaux uh, cave unless you're a scientist because they have to protect it. But what the French did, because they can be very meticulous about their art, and they're wonderful that way, what the French did was perfectly recreate it with every bump and every rock and everything painted exactly the same. They said the only difference is there's this non-slip fo floor, which I remember I looked down because I had read about it. And I'm, but it's still something that just profoundly moves you. And the Ice Age art exhibit in London, which was done I've never seen a more spectacular exhibit in my life. It was dumbfounding what they put together. And they had a room where they not only simulated the different 
t you know ceilings of the caves that you know from the shamanic point of view of the um, well they used um, animal fat you know t they burned animal fat for the um, lights they had in there that's so they were showing it flickering like you would with one of those in the room and of course people are discovering the acoustics in the caves and these buildings and how perfect they are they think there was chanting and and um, I'll get more into that later but it's pretty remarkable and when you were in there it was just this I mean who needs HBO when you have that you know <laughs> that scenario every night because it's so profound and moving to be able to hang out there like they did um, and one of the things that was very ancient in the skies and I found this fascinating is um, I called it birds, bees, and bulls, bulls slash cows, and that's sacred earth, sacred sky. And um, we're getting a little bit into the Maltese here and a few other places. And um, you'll see what how they indicated swans. This, they didn't say specifically it was somewhere between 40,000 and 20,000 years old. So Malta is very, very, very old. <laughs> Everything there is, and. Um, Targin is um, the above ground site that's part of a huge complex at the Hypogeum, part of the underground site. Um, this shirt was from the uh, western field at Targin, and the top, you know, the top is the lip of a pot, then the decoration is a bird in between the horns of the, of the cows. And so they were very uh, involved with the birds and the swans, and you'll see the bees. Um, that was a bit later period, actually that's not correct, because Targin actually stretches from being extremely old. You'll see that on your sheet there. Um, it's a very old site uh, that also had additions, as best we can tell, or certain certainly additions in the art, because um, they're, they're quite certain that when Fira, or modern day Santorini, blew up and pretty much wrecked the Minoan civilization. A lot of the people who escaped went to Malta. So they, well, they went to a lot of places from what we can see around. Um, I think the Etruscans were influenced, the, uh, the Maltese were influenced. But it's a spectacular um, set of things. And this is another one, uh, Peshmerol. I'm probably not saying that correctly. A uh, cave also in France is 20, 23,000 years old. And this is when these, again, my brilliant, brilliant mentor teacher's um, discovery. She noticed that the drawing in there by one of the hands that you always see with the red ochre um, around it in the caves that you see so, so much, it's what we, what we now see is this, the exact same shape as Cygnus, the swan, just like these ancient swans. So. That was one of my favorite things was finding that and I kept and I didn't know why swans and why the vulture was mystical and had to do with music. We'll deal with that in a second too, because I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, you'll see now this is Lakota. So this is our own continent, and you'll see that shape, it's like the swan. It also has a little sexual connotation if you think of it that way, but that's how they viewed everything. It was life recreating itself and the birds. and um, The swan is the shamanic bird. It's still considered the shamanic uh, constellation. And um, so this is all still tied. But you can see this is from Wendy's book, Imaginal Skies. Like I said, I have copies back there and I have a handout so that if you want to order from her, you can go to her website and do all that. Because these books are phenomenal. If you want to learn stargazing, she explains it all so beautifully with, with an artist and a and an artist's eye as well as it's also the the eye of a brilliant astrologer and mythologist. So um, it's wonderful. Well, uh, the one Imaginal Skies actually has two CDs with it where she talks you through it and tells you her wonderful mythic stories. So I definitely wanted to spend a lot of tonight acknowledging her wonderful work because it had so much to do with teaching me more. Um, I actually had that Glasgow bowl and how it was up on my site in 2002 before I even knew about Wendy. But she's, I couldn't find very many people who could expand what I already knew 10, 20 years, 10, 15 years ago. And um, Wendy's teaching me all these new things, so I'm 
very excited about her. She takes students by application and if she sees by your chart that it's going to work for you to be a mythic astrologer. So, I mean, people can apply to study with her, but you have to meet certain astrological criteria. If she sees that you really don't have it in your chart to be able to technically handle astrology and really imbue it with the mythology, you know, it's kind of thanks but no thanks because she's actually doing you a favor by not charging you when she thinks you wouldn't be able to carry on her torch. So, like I said, I feel thrilled and honored to be studying with her. Um, now we have the crescent moon. I just happened to have, while I was working, um, one of the old Harry Potter movies on. <laughs> and I looked up on that long table where they all um, meet. That's why I had to put this up here. You'll see this image of the moon phases. And that entire long table, um, what looked like exactly like this, and it turns out they just discovered, because somebody is selling a piece on South, at Sotheby's, that she was, uh, J.K. Rowling was an astrologer. She, the, what the person is auctioning off for, you know, immense amount of money is, um, she had hand drawn some artwork and done a baby's chart for a friend. And so it's the full astrological chart that she read. So she, if you watched it, it's so much fun to watch Harry Potter for me now because there are all these astrological references and they even have the birth dates. The birth dates, were, she was expressing certain signs with the birth dates. It's just stunning. Um, ANS, which is the Astronaut Astrological News Services, which all the major organizations work together to put out, they put that out. So if you want to find the article, or I could, you know, email me and I'll send it to you. But um, the uh, article's fascinating because they go into great detail about her astrological symbolism and, and the charts for the different children. I mean, it's day, month, and year. You can, you, you know, you don't have a birth time for them, but you can look up a solar chart for every character in her, in her books. So it's a fascinating thing. So that's one of the things I wanted to show here and show how the crescent moon and also the bull's horns are, uh, rep are represented in so many of these symbols. You'll see um, that's Hathor, the, um, well, Isis, da Isis um, daughter-in-law, I guess you would put it. Um, she's the one who married Horus, her son, and she was the next one, and she's a cow goddess in Egypt, and you can see the, the crescent moon holding the star, the sun, you know, is like, in, in the embrace of the crescent moon is Horus' symbol as he was a solar god like his father Osiris. And that's another symbol of her where you can see the triangular face with the white, you know, it's the, the triangle of the um, horns and the feminine triangle, the feminine genitalia that, that they always show. You can see this in um, the Venus of LaSalle, which I couldn't get to. I actually went to the museum where she is in Bordeaux and they had a section closed off and there were about a hundred kids and I couldn't, I, after going all the way to Bordeaux, I didn't get to see it in person. But I love the picture and that crescent that she's holding in her hand, the crescent moon, it has 13 notches, um, which is uh, the 13 lunar cycles in a year. But beyond that, um, I was listening to an old Demetra George recording and she said that's the age that women become fertile too. So it may have made that reference that she's also pointing to her pregnant belly uh, in, in this. So I thought that was a fascinating take that hadn't even dawned on me. I was just thinking about the 13 lunar months. Um, so that's pretty fascinating. And they were back to the Tarjan. I was just trying to show how it all comes back together again. These are ongoing symbols. They're so built into our psyches and they have everything to do with life. That's why, I, you know, back then, uh, sexuality wasn't bad, you know, they, they worshiped the fact that they could recreate, you know, babies. So um, it's quite beautiful. And a lot of the women, someone had worked out what it was and you could actually tell by the shape of the woman um, what age she was because they revered all women. Women who had already born ch children, of course, had a fuller figure, but they didn't have the pregnant belly. And um, so those were revered women for having given birth. And then the maidens were shown 
as the more slender uh, drawings, you know, kind of like things work for us women as we find out as we get older. You know, all of a sudden things get a little rounder as we get older. Um, I'm discovering even if you haven't had biological children. So, um, but it is, they, they, you know, both, all the women were revered, the maidens, <laughs> as you would put it, or the, or the uh, women of age to give birth, and then the elder women who had given birth, they were highly revered and respected for their wisdom. So it was, you know, a lot of, a lot of it was during a Torian age. This is older than that, obviously. It's gone through many, many cycles. Um, a lot of things were when Virgo was the anchor, where it was the age of Virgo. So you'll see quite a bit of that. And you'll see things, you know, with the lion when, when the equinox, spring equinox was in Leo. You can see how it, you can almost time the art <clears throat> in roughly 2,000 year cycles by what, where the um, spring equinox was each year, the northern hemisphere anyway. Um, then I love this one. And this is where we get into the mother, the lover, moon and Venus, and it's the same sacred feminine, different expression, different lights in the sky and the crescent and the V. And I love this. this. Picasso made this bowl from being inspired once again by all the bowls in the ancient art. And this is bicycle parts. <laughs> you can see it's a bicycle seat and handlebars that he put together. And I just thought that was wonderful. And then, of course, people, I think the, the Da Vinci Code and other people have pointed out, you know, prior to him, the V that's prominently displayed in um, the Da Vinci's uh, Last Supper and how the apostle who looks like a woman, no doubt, was a woman. <laughs> so, and this was um, a stalactite hanging down in Chavette Cave in France and painted on it are both the feminine V, the lower torso of a woman, and above that is a bull. So they very much put those two things together and you can see that that's the 17,000 B BCE, which would mean about 19,000 years old. So these are pretty ancient. And now you can see where I'm, I don't know if, how many of you read the Da Vinci Code. Um, it was, uh, he ta they talk about the pyramid at the, um, at the Louvre, and there's one down in the subway station down below that is the feminine bee, you know, the feminine pyramid. And I will get a little bit into that, um, but I'm gonna stop now and see if anybody has any questions or any comments. Um, so is that, oh, I'm sorry. Is the light tight someplace else now? They removed it from a cave and put it in the museum? I think it was just photographed in the cave. Oh. Because Chevette, I'm not sure I'm trying to remember if that's the one that you have to actually scuba dive to get into. There's one of them that you have to scuba dive to get into it. Maybe that one in France. And um, I think it's just open to people who are capable of doing that and, and a lot of scientists who also do that. You kind of have to do that to get there. So um, I'm not sure how accessible it would be unless you do scuba diving and you get the permission to go in. But that's. Uh, that's where that is. Um, now this is something that we had Gary Caton here in 2010 and uh, he and an oftentimes partner, although they work separately as astrologers, Adam Gainsberg, have both worked extensively on the phases of Venus and um, the path of Venus. And you can see that Venus makes a V in the sky and her path across the sky and Mars basically rises up in the sky and descends and height, you know, is put, disappears into the sun. Venus is disappeared into the sun. She goes very high. She goes up 47 or 48 degrees, I believe, 47 degrees um, away from the sun in the morning sky. And then she descends and disappears into the sun again. And then you see her, and this is where she is now. You can just see her now. There's a, I was hoping, I did want to point out to everybody that there is, hopefully when you drive home, especially if you're driving towards the southwest or the southwest, uh, you hopefully will be able to see the brand new crescent moon uh, right, right around 9 o'clock, just after 9 o'clock, with um, Venus and Mercury up there. So it's a spectacular sight right now. And she's in that particular phase where she's been back with the sun, but she's an evening star now. 
And uh, they seem to be very aware of the V pattern and women, you know, for, for any number of reason and the repetition of the symbolism. So um, that's what this is about. So I wanted to acknowledge, this is a, an article, if you happen to have the December 2009 Mountain Astrologer, it's an article that Adam Gainsbourg wrote, and it's called A New Model for Full Planetary Phases, Venus, Venus Journey. And um, that's how you get, that's the, um, how you get it up on the uh, internet if you want it. And I have handouts at the back for both Adam's work and Wendy's and um, with all the contact information, how you can learn from them. And as well as a gentleman who led us and wrote a book about Malta who's a native Maltese. So that'll be all in the back when we go. Um, let's see now, here we have, um, you can see the nice beautiful sort of star shape that Venus makes. You can see that Mars is conjunctions with the Sun and the different points. It's very, it's almost like you can see why he was, the, the pattern would be about him being cutting, you know, cutting things and things. It's almost like a sharp uh, change in the pattern. So it's, it's very interesting how they, and obviously he's red, so he's, um, but he's had that masculine image for so long and Venus the feminine image for so long. Although obviously both are both and we have both in us, all of us do, so. Um, but that I thought was exciting. And here are just examples of how nature reproduces the Venus star and I think, and the spiral, which show up so much in these ancient sites. But I, Plumeria is one of my favorite flowers, you know, the tropical flower, so that's up there. And then that lovely sand dollar couldn't be more perfectly. See the five, it's almost like the five beams off the star itself. That's just a magical thing. And you can see why she was the goddess rising out of the sea as well with the five. And then the core of an apple, if you slice it, you know, a certain way, you can see how it makes a perfect star. Of course, the Vitruvian man was the same shape, the same symbol, the legs apart, the hands, arms out in the head, making the star shape. And then the rose, of course, has that repeat where it's really a spiral of petals. And then there's that beautiful shell that has the same thing. So, you know, spirals and stars were very, not so much, I think they weren't just feminine symbols. They were feminine energy symbols, spiral and masculine energy symbols. When you would commune with the sky and the earth, you would commune with the, um, the um, masculine and the feminine and that energy was palpable, I think. I'll talk about that more when I get more into Malta. Um, and here's more of that where it's the feminine shape. This I thought was fascinating. This was, someone had an instrument set up where they use the very light powder and he was using like musical tones to see how, what kind of shapes were created from those specific vibrations and an earthquake hit. And this was what it created. It created a rose with like the feminine opening, as you would put it, um, there. And I love the way it's repeated here. And you can see this original up in the, in the, at the Nelson, if you go over, like I said, around the corner, you have to, you have to get tickets, but it's pretty spectacular. And, but even like the, the way the dress repeats, that, the, yeah, really, it's so beautiful. And she's so beautiful. Natasha Gelman. Isn't she beautiful? Yeah, that she was, he was, um, God, what is Mr. Gelman's first name? They were Russian and came, um, I think, probably Russian Jews. And they had to escape during, you know, before the war. So they came to Mexico, as a lot of people did. And he was a filmmaker. So his films are also showing over at... Uh, the Nelson at the same time, they're scheduled, I think it's every Friday or Saturday. Anyway, you can look on the internet and see when that is, but, um, or call them up. But I just thought that was a beautiful little repeat. Where, and how interesting that an earthquake, that series of vibrations created that with the rose in the middle. Pretty fascinating. So energy certainly creates shapes. We know that. And I think this is what I'm getting into about these Maltese sites. Stonehenge, all of them. What we're just beginning to learn is the sound that they created. So it was like a full on